Okay, good evening. Good evening. For those who are watching on the internet, if you were tuning in to watch our series Revelation Through the Eyes of the Tanakh, we're going to continue that next week. This week, we are taking a week to uh, teach about preparation for Pesach, for Passover, because Passover is coming up quickly. Uh, as with every community, there are new people that come in that haven't uh, celebrated Passover, maybe people that have been around before but just wanted clarification. Uh, we had a lot of questions come in, so we brought in our expert, Amen. Abigail Fatkins, to well, no. share about how to prepare your home uh, as well as your heart for Passover. Yes. And so that's what we're going to do tonight. And then next week, we'll be back on uh, Revelation through the eyes of the Tanakh. So uh, tune back in then. And with that, we're going to turn it over to Abigail. Yay. And talk loud so that people in Alaska can hear you. Yes. Wow, that's a long way. My voice won't carry all the way to Alaska, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, and since I do normally talk quietly, I'm going to ask that you keep the side conversations to a minimum because I've been talking all day, already at work. All right, so preparing our home for Passover. Um, one of my passions is kashrut and keeping kosher. Um, I think that's probably why I've taken to this um, so much. Um, with Passover coming up, hopefully we're all thinking about getting prepared since it's just, a, what, four weeks away. Um, things to do to be ready. Uh, I think since God's word is the foundation of our faith, it's important that we look there first for clues of how to properly prepare. If you w have your Bibles with you and you want to turn to Exodus 12 with me. Okay. And that's verse 14 through 20. This is the first mention of Passover preparation. This day is to be a memorial for you. You are to keep it as a feast to Adonai. Throughout your generations, you are to keep it as an eternal ordinance. For seven days, you are to eat matzot. But on the first day, you must remove chametz from your houses. For whoever eats chametz from the first day until the seventh day, that soul will be cut off from Israel. The first day is to be a holy assembly for you as well as the seventh day. No manner of work is to be done on those days except what is to be eaten by every person. That alone may be prepared by you. So you are to observe the Feast of Matzot, for on this very same day have I brought your ranks out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you are to observe this day throughout your generations as an eternal ordinance. During the first month, in the evening of the 14th day of the month, you are to eat matzot until the evening of the 21st day of the month. For seven days, no hametz is to be found in your houses. For whoever eats hametz, that soul will be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is an outsider or one who is born in the land. You are to eat no hametz in all your houses. You are to eat matzah. All right, that's the first one. I like to point out um, the importance of noticing when things are repeated in the text. Um, specifically, in verse 14, I will point out uh, Passover is called a memorial, and I really feel like that talks about how this is to be a continuing practice among the people of God, because the text clearly states throughout your generations and eternal ordinance, um, and it, that it's to be kept year after year, which I believe is also mentioned in another passage we'll go over later. I just like to ask why, why we might think that Adonai would impress this year after year, this eternal ordinance, why would he impress that on us? I was thinking about this uh, last night when I was preparing. Uh, I believe we always need this constant reminder. I don't know about you, but I know I forget sometimes who I am and need a reminder to get back, 
focused on what it is I'm here about. Um, a reminder of our redemption. And like all the other holidays and commandments, I believe that these things are a gift to help us to grow and to build our faith. And that's definitely a constant. We should always be growing. We should always be building. Um, I, and I also like to point out that in the text here, it talks about that the uh, feast belongs to God. It's not just a Jewish thing. It's his. And I think to say anything else is sort of taking that away from him in, in a small way. Uh, Leviticus 23.2, I just wanted to point out. Leviticus 23.2. I did not march, mark all these, so... I spoke to Moses saying, speak to B'nai Israel and tell them, these are the appointed Moedim of Adonai, which you are to proclaim to be holy convocations, my Moedim, or my appointed times, going back on the, the point about it being his. Um, back to Exodus 12, chapter 12, verse 15, it talks about eating matzah for seven days, or unleavened bread. And it also talks about removing the chametz, or yeast, from your houses. Chametz, or yeast, is a symbol for sin. And as we prepare for Passover, our focus should not just be on the physical preparation, but also on spiritual preparation. It's important that our heart is in the right place when we are keeping the Passover. Uh, there's a Hebrew word that speaks to that, and it's kavanah, and it means intention, like doing something on purpose. Um, I encourage you all, as I say this, I'm encouraging myself at the same time to be intentional as you prepare for the upcoming holiday. Um, it is important also to note that while you're making physical preparation uh, of removing the chametz from your house, also um, to remove things other than food that could be considered a chametz or sin, um, or removing bad habits, say, from your life that you might have picked up that are not uh, constructive. So it is important that we allow ourselves to be humble um, before God and allow him to show us those things that we need to remove and be obedient to whatever he says. I think all of us know, at least at some point in our life, what a tremendous blessing obedience really brings. Uh, if we will turn to 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8, the back of the book. <laughs> Gotta get some bricotta shot in here. <laughs> no good. Don't you know that a little comets leavens the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old comets so you may be a new batch, just as you are unleavened. For Messiah, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. There, therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old comets, the comets of malice and wickedness, but with unleavened bread, the matzah of sincerity and truth. This passage is also very clear, instructing us not just to keep the Passover, but how to keep it. We also have the example of Messiah Yeshua, because he was always faithful to keep the Passover during his lifetime. Some other passages that mention Passover, Exodus 13, going back. Three through 10. Thank you. You're like, Yes, three through ten. Thanks, Rabs. Yeah, that's my nickname for him. Let's see. 
the Rabs and Ab show. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Moses said to the people, remember this day on which you came out from Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by a strong hand Adonai brought you out from this place. No chametz may be eaten. This day, in the month of Aviv, you are going out. When Adonai brings you into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which he swore to your fathers to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, you are to observe this service during this month. For seven days you are to eat matzah, and the seventh day is to be a feast of Adonai, to Adonai. Matzot is to be eaten throughout the seven days, and no chametz is to be seen among you, nor within any of your borders. You are to tell your son on that day, saying, It is because of what Adonai did for me when I came out of Egypt. So it will be like a sign on your hand and a reminder between your eyes, so that the Torah of Adonai may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand, Adonai has brought you out of Egypt. You are to keep this ordinance as a moed from year to year. I think I mentioned before the year to year thing throughout your generations as an everlasting ordinance. I think that's pretty clear that it's not something done away with or irrelevant to us. Mm -hmm. um, it's also important to note, and I'm sure she was going to say this, that the commandment doesn't just say not to eat yeast but we're actually commanded to eat matzah. And so it's both sides of the command that we have to observe. It's not just not to eat kametz, but you're commanded to eat matzah. So you have to at least eat some. Yes. So um, also something else from this passage I really like to point out is why are we doing this? I love it when God gives us reasons for why we should keep his commandments. He doesn't always do that. And of course, the obvious thing, I know Rabbi has said it before, is, well, God said it, therefore we do it. Um, so that's the obvious reason, but here it tells us when your children ask, or that you're to tell your children, that it is because of what Adonai did for me when I came out of Egypt. And we've all come out of our own personal Egypts and continue to come out of our own personal Egypts. Um, and that this should be why we do this, because we remember where we were, where we are now, and how great and merciful God has been toward us. Mm -hmm. um, so that should be the motivation behind these things as well. And remembering that it was his power, his might, his arm that did it, and not ourselves. Yes, exactly. Is it short and have the same set? That's fine. <laughs> I speak men. <laughs> yes, yes. All right, and then I have... Exodus 23, 14, and 15. Moving along. <coughs> Three times in the year you are to celebrate a festival for me. You are to observe the Feast of Matzot. For seven days you will eat Matzot as I commanded you at the time appointed in the month of Aviv, for that is when you came out of Egypt. No one is to appear before me empty-handed. So again, it's just reiterating what has already been said before. Leviticus 23. I'm sure that is a much faster page turning there on the computer than I am. Old Testament, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> These are the appointed feasts of Adonai, holy convocations which you are to proclaim in their appointed season. During the first month, on the 14th day of the month, in the evening, is Adonai's Passover. On the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Matzot to Adonai. For seven days you are to eat matzah. So for seven days. Numbers 28, 16 through 17. Are you noticing a pattern and a theme as we go through the scriptures? The repetition. It's 
very important for the On the 14th day of the first month is Adonai's Passover. On the 15th day, there is to be a feast. For seven days, matzah will be eaten. Again. <laughs> if you didn't get it the first two times, <laughs> I think the point is made. Okay, Deuteronomy 16, 1 through 8. No, I turned right to it. That's nice. <laughs> Observe the month of Aviv and keep the Passover to Adonai your God, for in the month of Aviv, Adonai your God brought you out from Egypt by night. You are to sacrifice the Passover offering to Adonai your God from the flock and the herd in the place Adonai chooses to make his name dwell. You are not to eat hametz with it. For seven days you are to eat matzot with it, the bread of affliction. For you came out from the land of Egypt in haste. Do this so that all the days of your life you will remember the day when you came out from the land of Egypt. No comet should be seen with you in all your territory for seven days. And none of the meat you sacrifice on the evening of the first day may be left overnight until the morning. You may not sacrifice the Passover offering within any of your gates that Adonai your God is giving you. Rather, at the place Adonai your God chooses to make his name dwell, there you will sacrifice the Passover offering in the evening at sunset, the time of your coming out from Egypt. You are to cook and eat it at the place Adonai your God chooses. Then you will turn around in the morning and journey home. For six days you are to eat matzo. On the seventh day there is to be a solemn gathering for Adonai your God. On it you are to do no work. Okay. Are you going to talk about that? Yes. Okay, I'll let you talk about it. Well, yes. I just basically wanted to point out the recurring themes of eating unleavened bread or matzah for seven days, no chametz or yeast to be found in your house, um, and in the Hebrew, the command specifies no yeast. <coughs> okay, I wanted to point out a couple of things. One, that the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a no-work day, and the seventh day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a no work day. Now you have to remember that Pesach or Passover is actually the evening before the first day of unleavened bread. So the 14th at evening is Passover and then unleavened bread starts at sunset and goes for seven days. Now in the diaspora in Judaism there is an eighth day that's celebrated and that's because of difficulties in calendars and times and when the sun is up and so everybody celebrates the, the thing, but the commandment says seven days. So you are welcome to observe the eighth day or the seventh day, but seven day, I mean, as far as keeping comets, you can keep it for eight days or seven days, but the first day and the seventh day are the holy days for the holy convocations. And so it's important to note that those are non-working days. Those are high holy days. In the book of John, the first one is called the high Sabbath, the second one is also a high Sabbath, and that's where we start counting the Omer from. Another thing I wanted to point out from these particular verses is the scripture does not allow us to offer the actual Passover sacrifice anywhere but in Jerusalem in the place where God placed his name. So if you're running around and you're in Alabama or Pensacola or Mississippi or Louisiana or somewhere else, and you're making a sacrifice of a lamb trying to fulfill this scripture, you are violating the very commandments of God by doing that. You are not obeying, you're disobeying by sacrificing a lamb anywhere but in Jerusalem. And we don't sacrifice one in Jerusalem because there's not a consecrated priesthood, there's not an altar that's been consecrated, there's things that have to happen in order for that to be done. Would it happen if all those things were done? I believe absolutely. The reason I believe absolutely is because for 30 years after Yeshua's death, the followers of Yeshua continued to go to the temple and sacrifice on the Moedim. We read of Paul making journeys back to Jerusalem on the appointed days, on the feast days. So they continued to make sacrifices in the temple after the death of Yeshua up until the destruction of the temple. With the destruction of the temple, the killing off of the priesthood and those things happening, the sacrifices ceased. 
they will be reinstated at some time in the future with the millennial, the reestablishment of the temple and priesthood, people coming from all the nations to celebrate Sukkot or tabernacles and all those things that happen. So, with all that said, the best we can do today is observe a memorial feast of Passover. We do everything that we can do in observance, in trying and striving to obey the scriptures to the best of our ability. We clean our house of kamets, we eat bitter herbs, we uh, eat the matzot, we, we dip the, the uh, karpas, we do the things that we're able to do, memorializing and looking forward to the time where that statement at the end of our Seder where we say next year in Jerusalem is an actual thing and we will actually be able to make the Shalosh Regalim or the three pilgrimage feasts again. So it's important to remember we are not keeping Passover, we are keeping a memorial of Passover until the time when we can actually keep the Passover. Because the Passover is technically the sacrifice of the Lamb on 14th of Nisan at twilight. Everything else is unleavened bread. In the middle of unleavened bread, or not actually the middle, towards the beginning part, we have uh, the Feast of first fruits of the barley harvest, and then we start the counting of the Omer as we go toward Shavuot or Pentecost. So all of that happens within this seven-day period, but uh, or eight-day period altogether, but uh, we can only, as believers today, memorialize what we're looking forward to doing and remember back at the things that they were able to do but we can't do right now. Linda, if you're going to ask a question, ask it loud. So what are the first and the seventh day this year for us to keep the Solomon Feast? Um, the first is the... Is it the evening of the 30th of March. It's yeah. actually a weekly Sabbath, the first day of unleavened bread. Yeah, the first night of the actual night of Pesach, going into unleavened bread, is a Friday night this year, and it's the thirtieth. And then seven days from then, which would be Thursday evening of the following week through Friday evening. So we're going to have a double Shabbat. Woo! 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 Yes. That you don't work. And it's all the non-working days are on the calendar that we printed out and gave to everybody and give to all of our visitors here. So you have an actual calendar, pictures of Israel, and the dates on it for observing. So that's important to note. One thing this year that's important to note that I find uh, really a blessing is that normally there are three different calendars that come into effect at this time of year. You have the Greco-Roman calendar, which the whole world follows, where we have March and April, and the church uses it for their cycle of celebrating uh, the resurrection and Pentecost. Then we have the Pharisaic calendar, which counts from the uh, counting of the Omer from the day after the High Sabbath, and then goes on through Shavuot, and then there's the Sadducean calendar, which begins its counting of the Omer from the day after the weekly Sabbath, and then goes on. This year, because of the way the days fall into place, the Pharisaic calendar and the Sadducean calendar are identical, because the first day of unleavened bread is on and follows up. So you have the counting of the Omer. Both are counted on the same calendar this year, and... The Christian calendar is celebrating Pentecost on the same day that the Jewish calendar celebrates Shavuot or Pentecost. So all three calendars are lined up this year. So all of the arguments about who's right are moot this year because everybody's right for a change. And we can, and because of that, we're trying to set up to have a special uh, unity service with some of our uh, our friends from around that are all believers in Messiah. And so uh, it's just something that's, that's unique. So as we deal with these verses, we have to deal with the three calendars. We have to deal with the first and seventh day. We have to deal with the, um, the not sacrificing a lamb anywhere but in Jerusalem.
So all those things are important. I did want to mention one other thing that in one of the earlier passages, and I can never remember which one, uh, it does talk about how even on the non-work days that food preparation is permissible. I think it's important that everyone knows that on high holy days, what you need for that day, that, that work is okay. It's permitted in the text. Um, that was one other thing I forgot to actually write to mention. Right, and someone is going to ask at some point, why are we having our community Passover Seder on Tuesday when Passover is on Friday? And the reason for that is that we want to be able to have a community Seder. If we did it on the first evening, we would go into the work, the non-work day. And all of the work involved in putting on a meal for 400 people would violate the Sabbath. You know, having a Seder at your home for, you know, 15 or 20 people when your family all gets together is one thing. But having a meal for 400 people with people serving and cleaning up and all the stuff that goes on, it would violate the commandment to do that. So we encourage, as is tradition, that everybody have a Seder at their home or with neighbors or friends on the first night and then join us as a community on the Tuesday night for our community Seder as we celebrate together because unity is also an important biblical concept. So we want both to be observant and have the family Seder together on the first night like uh, is tradition and also the second night for those uh, that extend and then there is a Seder done on the last night of Passover also and then our community Seder will be on Tuesday because it not only won't violate the Shabbat by working because Monday would violate the or, uh, Saturday Sunday if we did it Sunday it's the non-work day and then goes into Monday night and all that and then if we did it Wednesday our friends from the churches wouldn't be able to come be with us because they would like to be at their service on Wednesday so we said Tuesday works and that's why we do Tuesday night. Fine. You're up. All right. So now that we've covered most of the scripture, I have one more thing to mention, and then we'll get into the uh, required observances versus traditional observances. Um, it's, I think it's really important to bring up why the matzah is labeled kosher for Passover and why some isn't. Uh, matzah that is labeled kosher for Passover has been prepared quickly. That is in 18 minutes. Or so, less. Or less. So the flour and water mixture has no chance of becoming leavened or collecting wild yeast. Interestingly, in Exodus 12, 17, the Hebrew is translated, observe the Feast of Matzot. But when I open my own Hebrew text, and I don't know a lot of Hebrew, but I know enough to read that it like literally looks like it says, guard the matzah. And this is the place in the scripture where the rabbis get the quickly prepared specifically for the purpose of Passover matzah. Um, that's why they've always been so careful is because they, do you want to look at it? And what tell was me? the verse? 1217. It, it basically looks like guard the matzah and I read this somewhere else too. Yes so. it is. It basically says guard the matzah. You know, it almost Ushmar conjures this. Et hamatzot. Yeah, it yes. conjures a picture of Shamar, Shomer is to guard to like Shomer Shabbat. This is guard the guard the matzah. Yeah, observe, guard, yeah. keep. So that's where they get the kosher for Passover matzah from. As opposed to the non-kosher for Passover matzah, which can cook as long as it wants to, and so on. And by the way, it's the same with other kosher for Passover products that are similar. Yes. So, I have a question. Yes. So the matzo for, for Passover, so the kosher part of it is it has to cook for like 18 minutes? It's got to be under 18 minutes. Under 18. Yeah. Once it hits 18, it's no longer. It comes from that whole being intentional as well. They're intentionally trying to make sure. There's a sure whole series of reasons. 18, so 18 or, or less? It's, not, it's, it's under less 18. If it goes into 18, if it crosses the 18 line, it's no longer a kosher professor. So. Traditionally, all leavening agents are also removed to avoid the appearance of leaven or sin. It is important that we understand the difference between tradition and what the scripture says. 
We are commanded no yeast, but there are those who may desire to remove the appearance of leaven, and we should not condemn those keeping the tradition, nor condemn those who in their home only observe the strict no yeast, as the scripture says. There are also Ashkenazi and Sephardic traditions to be aware of. Um, the Ashkenazi Jews traditionally prohibit the consumption of what they call kitniot or kitnios, which is legumes during Passover. These items, commonly known as rice, corn, millet, and legumes, have been banned for centuries by Ashkenazi Jews. Rice, corn, millet. Dried beans. For the people listening that couldn't hear. Yeah. Dried beans, lentils, peas, green beans, soybeans, peanuts, sesame seeds, poppy seeds, and mustard. Did you have corn on there? Okay. Yes, corn okay. at the top. Corn. Yeah. But those are all tradition. You can keep it if you'd like to, and we encourage those who feel uh, convicted to do so to do that, uh, and those that do not feel like they need to do that, just the yeast is what the scripture actually says. Yes. So I wanted to make sure everyone knew. So every Ashkenazi Jew becomes Sephardic. Over. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. I'm just kidding. That was because, just a bad joke. Yeah, the Sephardic... The Sephardic Jews are less strict on, on the kitniot. They permit it. But not on comments. No, no. That's, that's across the board. It doesn't matter who you are. All right. So to the physical preparations, the practical application, I have sort of put it into four-step category. Um, and By I, the way, if she hasn't told you, she has this stuff printed out to hand to you later. after she yes. gets done so you're not reading it while she's talking. Yes, because I didn't want you to get ahead of the teacher. My dance <laughs> students do this sometimes. They'll start practicing the next thing and when I haven't got to it yet because they already know hey, some of the dance. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Rabbi trails. <laughs> so identifying and removing the offending yeast products is step one for preparing when we're talking about physical preparations. The most obvious thing, of course, that we have to remove is bread. There are many things that contain yeast or yeast extract besides just bread and bread-like products. Many crackers also may contain yeast. Yeast extract is in use is used in various processed foods like canned soup, gravies, broths, packs of spices that are pre-mixed, vitamin supplements, or dog food. Some may choose to store their dog food outside the home during this time. It is best to read all the labels of the items in your cupboard that might contain yeast or yeast extract. This is something I talk about a lot when I teach the, the regular kosher class. When you're learning to keep kosher, when you're keeping kosher, all labels are subject to scrutiny. So read everything. That way you're not likely to miss it. Um, beer and most wines also are not kosher for Passover, just to point that out. Citric acid is another ingredient you might want to watch out for. It is actually, unfortunately, not just produced from citrus fruit as it used to always be. They now um, will grow a yeast or fungus and the citric acid is a byproduct and it's a cheaper way to produce it. So if you want to avoid the byproduct of the yeast, you may choose or not choose to observe that. I thought I'd better point it out so someone doesn't come back later and say, but Miss Abigail, you didn't say. So Barbecue potato <laughs> chips. Do they contain yeast? Almost <laughs> all of them have yeast in them. Aw, bummer. It's very sad. <laughs> well, you might can make your own. Okay, so when should we start step one? Identifying and removing these products. Now, now would be a good time. Usually, I say two to four weeks before Passover. Um, you can start separating them so that you can consume them or store them outside your home if you choose to do that or give them away. Um, My suggestion is because I'm a little stickler on some of this stuff because the Bible kind of seems to be. Um, so in traditional Judaism, they have this thing where they sell it to a Gentile and for a dollar and then buy it back. We don't do that. Um, I also don't just put it outside the door because the scripture actually says 
inside your houses and your gates. So it extends beyond. So what we do at our home, and this is what I would suggest that you do, go through your cupboards now, get everything that has chametz in it, put it on a table or counter or somewhere in your house you can identify, and then two weeks before Passover, two weeks before Passover, bring it to a homeless shelter, bring it to a food bank, the sealed stuff, you know, if it's not open, bring it and give it to somebody. Find a neighbor that can use it and give it to them. Don't wait till the last day because then you're taking what you're considering sin. You know, it's a sin for me to have it in my house, so here, let me put it into your house because you're already going to hell. <laughs> that's, that's not the way we're doing it. That's not our purpose. It shouldn't be our heart. You know, it, it's kind of like when, you know, if you were a, a drug dealer, and you got off of drugs, you wouldn't say, well, I've got these drugs left. You know, you got saved, you're off of drugs, you're living for the Lord, but you know, my buddy is still living like sin, so here, let me give it, that's not how you do things. So what we do is we go through our entire house, we get all of the food, we put it all, what we're gonna do, we start eating it, we invite people over for Kometz meals, which is what Abigail and Catherine did tonight, they had Pancakes? Yes, we did. To use up their chametz. So you have chametz <laughs> meals. You invite people over. It's a good opportunity to have fellowship. And a week and a half or two weeks before Pesach and Unleavened Bread begins, give it away to neighbors and friends so they have opportunity to eat it before the feast day begins. If they don't, that's up to them. But you tell them we would prefer for you to eat this in the next few days. <laughs> And then they make the choice themselves, but it's not you giving it to them where they're instantly going to be violating the commandment. Rebbitson. Also, turkey bacon. Only one turkey bacon that doesn't have yeast is the Jenny O. Yeah, check your turkey bacon. There's all kinds of things. you got to look. Uh, salad dressings have it. Um, so you just, you're just going to have to get out your magnifying glass and look at the labels. That's what and I say. Everything is subject to scrutiny. Everything. Linda, you had a question? No, I just want to remind you to make all the waffles you want. To yeah, we'll get all the waffles over the next, and then, yes. and then all that stuff will go out of the synagogue. All that stuff will go out of, uh, out of the house. Oh, so you basically but don't just sell it and get it back. Don't put it in. The, I don't think you should put it in your garage or put it in your, your car. Or put it, if you own it, if it's in your gates, it shouldn't have commits. Storage unit. Storage unit, same thing. If you own it, it, if it's yours, if you possess it, it's part of your gates. Doesn't matter if it's across town. Uh, so just it, it's the, the context is what you own. Yes, ma'am. Take the dog. I'm getting there. She's getting to that now. Getting there. Um, I personally, he covered like the next three sentences he just covered. But uh, I try to, as much as I can, like have it all out as many as three or four days before Passover. It is really better to get a head start, not wait till the last minute to get things done. I think he reiterated that for me before I said it. But um, also, when you do throw things away, like if you get down to it and you can't consume it and you can't give it away, throw it away. And I tried to put it in the dumpster before the last trash tow happened. You know, when they come back that. that way it's not even on your property. Right, that's why I was saying can. a week and a half or, or two weeks ahead. Yeah. Because if you put it out just before and the garbage people don't come, it's still on your property. If you're doing it. Go ahead. Oh, so like, I guess I didn't read over the part that says baking powder baking soda, yeast, citric acid. All of those, except for the yeast, the other ones are uh, things, some tradition, some choice you'll have to make. They are leavening. Mm -hmm. And so there's, to me, there, at my house, we take all that stuff out. Because I look at it and I say, well, it's leavening. I know it's not yeast, but it's leavening as opposed to legumes or corn or something like that, when that's not really leavening, it just plumps when you put it in water, and so that's where it comes from. So, you know, it has a reaction to water like yeast does, 
so they go in that pile. So we don't, we, we don't follow the Ashkenazic where you don't eat legumes and don't eat pasta and don't eat uh, corn and those things, but we do take all of the leavening, whether it's chemical or natural, out of our house. Yes. And, and so if you're asking what the halakha for our congregation is, we suggest that you do what I just said. Step two, cleaning. Yay. We'll be having cleaning parties all across the congregation. Am I right? <laughs> it's not actually a bad idea. You could get together and do this sort of thing if you wanted. Uh, Passover. And I suggest that while you're cleaning, you also get rid of your non-kosher for Passover wine. Yes. <laughs> that will help you get through it. <laughs> So, moving along, moving along. Passover is also the origin of spring cleaning, in case anyone didn't know that. And then I have um, things to consider when cleaning your house. Maybe you thought of these things, maybe you didn't, and I thought it is worth mentioning. Cleaning out your cupboards, cleaning the floors. Some people may go so far as to move the stove cleaning behind and under if they can. It's a good time to do that. Yes, it's what a good time. Pull out the wine. The wine. Uh, I remember I was at a say one time, they had kosher wine. Look. There's kosher for Passover wine, yes. and there's non-kosher for Passover wine. And by the way, when I make jokes about wine, I'm not really endorsing going out and drinking a bunch of wine. Please don't do that. I just want to make that clear, especially for the people watching on the internet. I am not pushing alcohol. I'm making a joke so that people understand. However, kosher for Passover wine is made with a fruit yeast, not a grain yeast. And so because of that difference, it's kosher for Passover as opposed to non-kosher for Passover. Magen David has uh, fruit, has kosher for Passover. It's, it'll uh, Mag Magen, Manischewitz, Magen David, uh, and, and other brands. Bartonora. You'll see Bartonora is uh, another one. It's an Italian brand that has uh, kosher for Passover wine. Uh, yeah, so there, there's a whole number of them that, that you can get this kosher for Passover. Speaking of which, if you're interested in maybe going together for those who do consume, I know someone who might be able to order something. I thought I better mention it before I forget. Moving back to cleaning. Uh, order what? Cleaning out That's your so oven is another thing that's really important to do. It is probably one of my least favorite Passover chores, cleaning out the inside of the oven. Don't forget your toaster oven. Don't getting, forget your microwave. I'm getting <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, and don't forget underneath the burners on your stove top. And like you said, microwave, clean out the microwave. Microwave. Yes, <laughs> toaster is impossible to clean out. So what I do is, there are two options really you can go with with this. You can either tie it up, and I have a um, closet outside my balcony, or you can buy a cheap one every year and just throw out the old one. <laughs> Some people do that. If you can't afford that, <laughs> I tie it up. I dump as much bread crumbs if and you, clean it out as If you take your toaster and you clean it the best way you can, the easiest way to clean a toaster is to plug it in and then stand in your bathtub. <laughs> and, and I'm, I'm just no. kidding. Do not do that. No, no, no. Do not do that. No. But if you if you clean the toaster out the best you can, shake it, rattle it, roll it, do all that stuff. Uh, you 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 know you'll get the majority of stuff out. They have a trap door on the bottom. You get in there, take a knife and no, unplug it first. Take a knife and, and you know get it clean. But do do what you can. Yes. Do um, not take the toaster in the bathtub. That was. Don't. We'll have to worry about that. Yes. Uh, yeah, there's. Uh, you got to make sure you say over and over on the video, do not do that uh, at all. All right, so next on my list of, 
of things to point out, cleaning out your drawers, your utensil tray, washing all your utensils, washing all your dishes, uh, cleaning out the fridge, cleaning out the freezer, cleaning the dining room, making sure you have washed your tablecloth so that there's no chemets on it, or getting a disposable one for Passover. That's easy, okay? Um, cleaning anywhere food could have been if there are children in your house, behind that your headboard, <laughs> <laughs> or if you're one of those people that sits in bed and eats crackers or something, oh. you're gonna have to wash all the bedding. <laughs> Look, a, a dust buster is your friend. Yes, yes. Do you have to throw sure. that away then? <laughs> um, <laughs> some people, some people may choose uh, to just simply wash all their dishes to get as much chametz off as they can. That is the more affordable thing to do. Others may choose to purchase a specific set of dishes that is only used at Passover. Um, that could be really special if you can afford it, but these are different ideas of how you can prepare your house. We have a set of chinette that we only use during Passover. Yep. That's good. I know this sounds like a That's lot That's those expensive paper plates. Oh, I got it. Um, this is a lot of work. We must acknowledge that. Um, but you work at it a little at a time. You start now. You get more everybody in your house involved, especially if your whole house is keeping kosher and, and celebrating Passover. Get the children involved. Make a game out of it. Yes. I can't tell you how many times growing up I had to do dishes and help with cleaning and do all these different things, and I so appreciate the wonderful life skills and the work ethic I learned from it. Yeah, it if you have a lot of experience. children, you can like send them out and have them like with their own dustpan, and whoever collects the biggest pile of crumbs gets a bonus and stuff like that. I'm serious. Kids love to do things if you challenge them that way. Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. I guess you'd be serious. You got to you eat in the car. Yeah, clean oh, out yes. your car. That's I hadn't thought of that. I'm so glad you bring that up. Yeah, your car, your trunk, because even if you don't eat in the trunk, you do have crumbs and stuff that go when you go to the grocery store. It's, it's still part of your borders. Right. Yeah. Um, Spring clean. That's right. It's really, really uh, important that as you're doing all these activities, that you take the time and the opportunity that God puts right here before you to meditate on the scriptures about Passover, to meditate on Psalm 51, create in me a clean heart, um, and, and all those things that God might bring to your mind in the process. I think it is yeah, probably... It's purposely difficult. <laughs> yes. Because the reality of letting God search our hearts for hidden sin, the hidden, hidden comets in our hearts, is a big deal. And so this is a symbolic way of looking at ourselves in that unique way. Yes, as we're physically doing things, spiritually doing things at the same time. And I'm hoping and praying, it is my desire that every single person finds some special blessing or revelation in this entire process of the preparation season. So when should we start cleaning? A week or two before Passover. Um, and don't forget to save a little chametz for the last ceremony preceding Passover. The searching for the leaven or the bedikat chametz involves the father hiding a small piece of leaven in a conspicuous place and letting the children find it so they can remove the last leaven from their house. Step three, and this is where things get even more fun, <laughs> buying your kosher for Passover matzah, matzah ball soup, all those wonderful foods that you want to be part of the feast and for the entire week. Just remember when you're buying, label scrutiny, check your ingredients. Um, one way to make that whole thing easier is to simply make things yourself if you can, if you have the time, if you have the ability. Um, and for those who partake of wine, remember to get certified kosher wine if you're going to be using wine. And there are, Publix usually has a pretty good display. Uh, I am also this week getting a list from Kosher Cajun of items that they're going to have and trying to arrange. They will drive by on their way to Destin and drop things off here to us. And they haven't, in the past, they've not charged us for 
shipping. They just pull off the highway and come here, offload and go. So if we can make that arrangement, we'll get the list to everybody. They can mark down what they want. They can uh, order it, pay, go, give the money to us, uh, and then we'll just pay them for it and they'll be delivered here and you can come pick up your stuff. Yes. Are those who are not familiar with the kosher Cajun food challenge? The kosher Cajun is a wonderful kosher restaurant mm -hmm. and uh, grocery store in uh, Metairie, Louisiana mm -hmm. that we have had a long time relationship with. They love us, we love them. And uh, he'll call me up and say, hey, I'm coming with stuff. Do you guys need anything? And uh, so we buy kielbasa from him by the case because I like kielbasa. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have kosher kielbasa and kosher andouille and kosher uh, shrimp and kosher well, oysters yeah. and kosher. <laughs> and none of it is made out of shrimp and none of it's made out of oyster, but they do have those items for, for people that want. You can go to kosher Cajun and get a glot kosher, 100% totally kosher oyster po' boy. Um, so um, I have not tried one, but I have seen it on the menu. It is not like McGuire's. You know, McGuire's has their kosher ham sandwiches and kosher stuff. It's not. It's their way of, of messing with people, kind of like their bathroom doors. Yeah. They used to have men's with an arrow to the and women's to the, they still do, but now they have the secondary sign inside. Uh, but no, they, but this is actually to totally glot kosher, yes. And they have a Facebook page and a website. Yeah, they have a Facebook page and a website, and you can order from them regularly, and we do. Step four, enjoy the week of unleavened bread. Woohoo! Yeah. Yay! Try starting new food traditions, like make your own matzo pizza night. One Which of my we had personal last favorites. Night. Peanut butter and jelly matzo lunches, matzo lasagna, matzo brittle, matzo with all kinds of dips, matzo ball soup, matzo brai, matzo tuna salad. Oh yes, matzo brai. That's where you like scramble an egg and you soak your matzo in it. You break it up and soak it in it, and then you cook it. And if you put cinnamon in it, it's like French it's toast. It's kind of like matzo French toast if you use cinnamon and sugar. If you a use maple syrup on We that. like to put egg, I mean onion and, and stuff in it and make it more savory. Yeah, if you like savory. Chicken salad, uh, tuna salad, sandwiches with your matzo. Be adventurous. And there are plenty of things you can Google on. Meatloaf. <laughs> You oh, can, yeah. cause yeah, cause you break the matzo up matzo. in the meatloaf, uh, meatballs, mm -hmm. all that you can use matzo for. Matzo ball soup, you already said. Yes. Matzo ball soup. Yum yum. By the way, Amazon sells the Manitoba's kosher matzo. Yes, and you can buy, and there's a whole bunch of varieties, but Amazon is a really good place to yeah. get it. If you order it now, you can get a five box for pretty reasonable. Um, and somebody told me, who was it? Oh, uh, Cindy Simmons says she always buys matzo for the next year right after Pesach because it's all on sale and matzo can't get stale. This is so true. I mean, it can, but she says it can't get stale. So, I mean, it's, so I don't necessarily promote that. I'm just saying that it's possible. I think it's also important that we remember in this whole process to be gracious to ourselves and to others because we're all still learning. And also to remember that some people may not be able to keep Passover and unleavened bread as well as they might want because of their family situation. They might be the only person in their house keeping Passover, keeping kosher. Um, it's just really, really important to remember we're all going to make mistakes and in the process hopefully learn some good lessons and graciousness is something that we should always have in, in light of all that. I have some handouts for all of you. I have pretty much covered all my material. And I want to, to say just two things. One is, uh, again, we encourage every family or people to group together in, in larger combined families and have a Seder on the first night of Pesach. And uh, we have some Haggadot that are available for those that may not have one that you can borrow to use for that at the synagogue office. Um, so you have that for that. Um, but, uh, and again, remember that every one of the feasts... Everybody may not know what that is. 
Haggadot is the, the Haggadah is the book that you use to follow through the order of the Seder. The word Seder simply means order. It's an ordered service. Every part of it tells the story of the Passover. So you start at the beginning and you turn page to page and you go in order. Around. Matter of fact, in Hebrew, when you say, how are you? The answer is Beseder. Everything is in order. Every, you know, all the body parts are where they're supposed to be and everything's going the way it's supposed to. All the pipes are running and things are happening. So, you know, Beseder. Everything is in order. So, um... <coughs> So when you, uh, when, you, when you do this stuff, remember that the purpose of Passover, the purpose of Yom Kippur, the purpose of Yom Tov or Rosh Hashanah is all to point us to relationship with God and that relationship comes through Yeshua. And it all points to him. So if you do your Passover Seder and you can go to the, like Publix and pick up a Haggadah, they have them for free. Uh, Maxwell House puts them out yep. every year. You can go get one for free of your own and just pick it up, but it's not going to have Yeshua in it unless you put it in it. So uh, just remember, a Passover without Yeshua, it doesn't fulfill the need. It's, Yeshua is the reason for Passover. His death, burial, and resurrection fulfill it and bring fullness to it. So when you're doing your Passover Seder at home, it's not about getting everything perfect. It's about the one that is perfect. And so don't get all uptight with making sure everything is right because chances are something's going to go wrong. <laughs> it's just the way it is. But don't get caught up in that because it's not about the meal. It's about the reason for the meal. The meal is a memorial feast. What's it a memorial? That means you remember something. It's not about the food. It's about the memory. And it's about what it's about. So please remember that if you have any questions... You can email me or you can email Abigail. You can email Catherine and she'll give the information to you uh, or send it to me and I'll send it to you. But, uh, you know, don't, you, you know it, don't stumble where you don't have to stumble. Just ask people. We'll, we'll help. There's a lot of people in the congregation have been doing this for years and they'll help you with it. So uh, just remember that uh, and enjoy it. It's, Passover is supposed to be a chag or a festival. Matter of fact, we read... Uh, in Exodus, it says it is to be a time of festival, a chag, not just a, a moed or an appointed time, but a festival, something we enjoy. And so we should enjoy it. And uh, we're going to close in prayer. Men's prayer. There's men's prayer tomorrow morning. Also, for those that would like to purchase Seder tickets, I have them available here tonight. For those watching online, you can go to our website, shalompensacola.com. Just look under events. A drop-down menu will come down. It'll say Community Passover Seder. Click on it. Follow the links, and it will take you to where you can purchase your Seder tickets online, and you can come join us. Also, if there's anybody in the room that would like to buy a copy of my new book, I have those available now. And also, if you're online, you can buy one on Amazon. This morning I woke up, and my book was the number one new release in its category this morning. So that was kind of exciting for that three minutes that it was there. And uh, so, Abba Father, we thank you so much. I thank you for Abigail and for her heart to share uh, her experience and her knowledge in these areas. We're thankful that she's here and that she could do this. Abba, we're thankful for the work she did and putting together the handout for everybody. And we just ask that this year's Passover will be the most significant we've ever experienced until the day that next year in Jerusalem, Lashana, Rabbi Yishlein, that we will spend it in Jerusalem with you. Hashem Yeshua Mashikainu, Amen. 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 Amen.